Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast of the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. I'm David Bowes, your host. In this podcast, we'll talk with the world-renowned pediatric neurosurgeon of Johns Hopkins, Dr. Ben Carson. Dr. Carson's recent commencement address at Emory University was greeted by a letter signed by 500 people, including professors, faculty, alumni, and graduate students, who expressed concern about Dr. Carson's failure to embrace evolution. We'll hear what he thought about that letter and why he's not likely to be convinced of materialist Darwinism. How did you feel when you heard about this letter of concern that was being sent around prior to your commencement address to Emory University? Well, I just felt that some people tend to be extraordinarily closed-minded and cannot consider that anything other than what they believe is true and correct. And I thought it was pretty silly, actually. Do you find that particularly disconcerting coming from the scientific community, uh, people who are supposed to be engaged in academic pursuits, challenging a man of your stature? Not really, because if you go back historically and you look at the world of science, you can find some pretty outlandish things that were thought to be the word. And as people become more enlightened, they change. But I'm sure in the future, we will find some things that make some of the things that we believe now in science look pretty silly. But at the time that you believe it, you believe that you are at the pinnacle of knowledge, that you know all things. (laughs) That's what they think. What kinds of things come to mind when people ask you, why do you question the theory of materialist evolution? What's the first thing that you think of? Well, the first thing is, how does something come out of nothing? And the second thing is, how does life evolve from non-life? If you want to talk about fairy tales, I mean, (laughs) those are incredible fairy tales. And the other thing is, I fully accept the concept of natural selection. It seems perfectly logical, perfectly reasonable, and you can document it. There's no question about it. But to grasp that and say that this is the foundational pillar of proof that evolution occurs, I think is taking it a little bit too far. What about the diversity of life here? How has your examination of life here influenced your view on the theory of evolution and whether or not there's an intelligent designer? Well, the evolutionists look at the similarities that you see in the various life forms, and they say, because this creature and this creature share the same type of digestive system or the same type of structures in their head, that clearly one evolved from the other. I don't know how clear that is, because if you have an intelligent designer, why wouldn't he use a basic structure that works on multiple different creatures? Just like an automobile manufacturer, General Motors, same basic chassis for Chevrolet, a Buick, a Pontiac, or a Cadillac. And yet, they're all different, and one did not evolve from the other. And why would you have to go and completely change the motor, the chassis, and all the other infrastructure because you're creating a different model? doesn't make any sense to me. And I think one of the most damning pieces of evidence against evolution is the human genome. You can see that you have a very complex, sophisticated coding mechanism four different amino acids and various sequences that give you millions of different genetic instructions. Very much like computer programming, which uses a series of zeros and ones and different sequences, but it gives you very specific information about what that computer is to do. Well, this is at least twice that complex because instead of just two digits, we've got four digits repeating in different sequences, but always resulting in the same thing unless there is a mutation. And if there is a mutation, it tends to lead toward degeneration rather than improvement. How has work on the human brain 
influenced your thought on intelligent design? Well, just knowing how incredibly complex our brains are, billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections, the ability to process more than two million bits of information in one second, that is an amazingly complex organ system. And to say that that just came about sort of randomly by various mutations over the course of time, when, as I just said, mutations tend to lead to degeneration rather than improvement, just doesn't make any sense. So the very things that they claim are evidence for evolution are the very things that damn the theory. And then the other thing is there are no intermediate species. Where are they? It shouldn't just evolve up to a certain point and then leap to the next species. There should be something in between at all given points in time, and there aren't. And no one's ever found them. I heard it once said that, and I think it was you who said it, if I remember correctly, that the human brain is more advanced than any kind of computer that we've come up with by a long shot. Could you give us an idea of just how complex the human brain is? Well, yeah. A single neuron in the human brain has so many different projections and so many different contacts that it alone can process 50,000 interactions in a second. And then you take that single neuron, you multiply that by billions, if not a trillion, and you begin to get some idea of the complexity. If you have to do a single thing, like I were to say to you, can you wiggle your middle finger for me? Well, you could do that immediately. And yet, when you think of all the things that had to happen, for me to ask you to do that and then you to do it back almost immediately, the list of processes that happen in your brain for you to do that, it would take me quite a long time to explain that to you. And yet, it's done instantly. One of the things that you point out in your book is that when you were speaking to the National Science Teachers Conference, you took a risk and talked about many of these things, about your feelings on uh, the possibility of intelligent design and the mystery of life and the way the universe is around us. But you recognize that the reaction of the people you're speaking to was that you were taking this great risk. What message would you have to those who are thinking about taking those kinds of risks, but maybe are not at the same point in their career as you are? Well, you have to be wise. You can't just say, I'm right, and therefore I will be vindicated, because that's not always the case. You have to use a little bit of wisdom. And in terms of the presentation, because I have these conversations frequently, rather than assume the same type of arrogance that some of the others assume, I just say, look, I'm going to tell you why I believe the way I do. You're certainly entitled to believe the way you do, but these are the factors that I consider when I'm making a decision. Dr. Carson, it's just a tremendous honor to speak with you, and I really appreciate uh, this time. I'm so grateful for your work, and I know on behalf of the Discovery Institute, we're very grateful for uh, you standing up for what you believe. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm sure the conversations will continue to be heated up, and I'm actually uh, getting ready to start a new book called The Organ of Species. Oh, that'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you so much. You. Help the Center for Science and Culture stand up for the right of dissent. Sign a petition to encourage Emory University to stand up to the bullies and defend Dr. Ben Carson's right to express his views. Look for the petition in ipetitions.com in the Science and Technology category. This concludes this podcast for the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. If you've enjoyed this program, please consider supporting the Center for Science and Culture. Go to idthefuture.com and click the Donate tab. This podcast is copyright 2012, the Discovery Institute. All rights reserved.